Hello, hello, Shagath Unknown here. Welcome to another Rust coding stream here on the 26th of December, 2022, local time, 10. Let's pop that off of here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about last time where we did the wave function collapse um, algorithm. And it was a big old beefy boy. It took like four hours. And we're seeing an example of it here. It just shuffled a bunch of stuff together. And now we're seeing it piece them all together. We're getting some very odd results on this one. A lot of this is going to be um, called out, it seems. Well, there, it may still fill in some of the central. Yeah, that was a very bad result. It's a very bad one. It, it's been very mixed. That's the uh, one of the um, DLAs. Try it a couple more times until we get it. Here we go. This, this is a better example of wave function collapse. I'm not sure what that other randomness was. I think it would be cool to put a heuristic in to uh, check the results of your map after doing wave function collapse and decide if you want to redo it, re-roll it. Um, because in that one case, it was a very, very tiny map. So today's uh, session is called what prefabs and sectionals. And there's a, a, a more full name on the uh, page here but if you look at the section at the sidebar here prefabs and sectionals um so it's prefabricated levels and level sections this is going to be a little bit related to what was done last time in wave function collapse where we can bring in these pre-designed things um so we're going to be using this and then next time some of this is also going to be supporting room vaults if i understand correctly so this is another uh pretty lengthy session so let's go ahead and, and get started here uh, despite being essentially pseudo random that is random but constrained in a way that makes for a fun cohesive game many roguelikes feature some handcrafted content typically these can be divided into a few categories we have handcrafted levels where the whole level is pre-made the content static these are typically used very sparingly for big set piece battles essential to the story we have handcrafted level sections some of the level is randomly created, but a large part is pre-made. For example, a fortress might be a set piece, but the dungeon leading up to it is random. Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup uses these extensively. You sometimes run into areas that you recognize because they are prefabricated, but the dungeon around them is clearly random. Cogmind uses these for parts of the caves. I'll avoid spoilers. Caves of Cod has a few set piece levels that appear to be built around a number of prefabricated parts. Some systems call this mechanism vaults, but the name can also apply to the third category. Handcrafted rooms, also called vaults in some cases. This level is largely random, but when some, uh, but when sometimes a room fits a vault, so you put one there. Okay, wording there is a little odd. The first category is special and should be used sparingly, so just purely handcrafted. Otherwise, your players will just start to learn an optimal strategy and power through it, and may become bored from lack of variety. The other categories benefit from either providing lots of vaults, so there's a ton of content to sprinkle around, meaning the game doesn't feel too similar each time you play, or being rare, so you only occasionally see them for the same reason. So we're going to do some cleanup now. So hopefully this part goes smoothly. In the Wave Function Collapse chapter, we loaded a pre-made level without any entities. Those are added later. It's not really very nice to hide a map loader inside Wave Function Collapse since that isn't its primary purpose. So we'll start by removing it. So we'll delete the file imageloader.rs and we'll build a better one in a moment. So we're going to edit the start of mod.rs in the waveform collapse. Okay. So let's go ahead and do these things. Where is imageloader.rs? Belete that. Get out of here. All right, so it's gone. And then we're going to go to the mod.rs here in waveform collapse. And we're going to have to do a little bit of editing. So we're going to remove a couple of things here. I'm going to pull in the new includes here. So we'll just pull that in from the, the page. And um, we should have some some anger coming in, but I'm not seeing it. Because we don't have the image loader stuff here. Um, take a look at a moment. So let me, oh, there it is. I was missing it. 
So let's take a look here at the struct. We have map, starting position, depth, history, noise areas, and derive from. So mode is actually not here. Which is interesting. Test map and derived. So we're getting rid of that, it looks like. And it will go to the impl. We're no longer passing in a mode. So it's the new depth, and it's derived from with the option. And we don't need mode anymore. And now we have this derived map function here. Um, I think we might have gotten rid of test map as well. So, yeah, I think we might be getting rid of it. Um, we're going to get rid of the mode from here. We'll actually just remove test map because it looks like it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Okay. So derived map, since we're no longer um, going to be using that, we could get rid of the mode because there's no longer two modes for it to run in. So derived map, um, we have some comments here that I will put in front of it. So derives a map from a pre-existing map builder. And um, it takes new depth and derive from. That looks good to me. And we're good to go. So we remove all images, all references to image loader, remove the test map constructor, remove the ugly mode enumeration. Uh, wave function collapse is now exactly what it states on the tin and nothing else. I'm thinking we will remove this because it's mode related. It doesn't specify that. It doesn't show that, but we're not using the test map anymore anyway. So there we go. All right. Lastly, we'll modify random builder to not use the test map anymore. That means I'm going to be a little bit lazy and we're just going to come in here and paste over that, just removing it because it modified our roll by one and it removed it from wherever it was at in here. Simple enough. So skeletal builder. We'll start with a very basic skeleton similar similar to those used before. We'll make a new file, prefab builder in map builders. Okay. So in map builders, we're gonna do prefab builder.rs. And I'm gonna just copy this skeleton in because it's simple. Um, we've seen this enough times, I don't need to go over it. Uh, map starting position, depth, and history. Pretty simple for the prefab builder. Um, and we have our basic impl block, and we have an empty build um, function here, ready to go. So that's it. We don't need to waste time on, on simple things that we've done over and over in the past, right? And now waveform collapse is happy. It's not even orange or whatever you call this color. Um, yellowish, burnt, <laughs> it's burnt urine color or something, I don't know. Um, so we're going to close that because we may not even need it for the rest of this. And we're going to just focus here on the code now. So we're going to do prefab builder mode one. It's going to be handcrafted levels. So we're going to support multiple modes for the prefab builder. So we're going to bake that in at the beginning in prefab builder.rs. So up here before the prefab builder, I mean, again, in Rust, it doesn't matter where you put your, your structs and enums. They don't have to come before you use them. But sometimes you, you like doing that. Also, we need to do another thing. Let's bring in prefab builder. That should be good enough. Okay, now we get some uh, completion hints and stuff in here. And we're allowing dead code. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I'm going to leave that off. It's in the tutorial, though. I prefer getting dead code um, information. Um, 
what did I do? Oh, the space. Yeah. There we go. When you're doing the uh, static reference like that, uh, lifetime, you can't have a space there. Um, okay. So we're making this prefab mode enum, which I'm guessing we're going to expand this later, which is why it's an enum. We'll see how it goes. And we have this rex level, which is a static string as our template. So it has to be static. Uh, if we're storing a reference to it, we have to keep that lifetime, basically. That's, I believe... That's what's going on there. If we just said ampersand string, yeah. You're doing a string slice and ampersand str type, basically. Um, a lot of times you do have to specify that type. And we see here, it is also the type of string literals, ampersand uh, static strings. So that's actually uh, the static string. Can I highlight that? Yeah. So this is what we're using for our string literal, basically, right? Okay. And then we're going to add that in here. Not builder. We're going to add that prefab mode in here. So this is a struct-like enum, and we're actually going to see that brought up here in the text. So let's look over at it. I feel like we've seen one of those before but uh, it's describing it. I feel like we've seen them in this tutorial though. This is a new, this is new, an enum with variables. This works because under the hood, Rust enumerations are actually unions. They can hold whatever you want to put in there and the type is sized to hold the largest of the options. It's best used sparingly in tight code, but for things like configuration, it's a very clean way to pass in data. We should also update the constructor to create the new types. So we'll go ahead and do that in a moment. And by that I mean right now, because it's mad. So we'll just say that. And it's going to be this here. And it's going to be that right there. So we're just hard coding it in as that string literal which is what we just talked about. Um, we'll see if that's going to, how that might or might not change later. Again, it's a mode. So I assume we're going to have different options here. So including the map template path in the mode makes for easier reading, even if it's slightly more complicated. We're not filling the prefab builder with variables for all the options we might use. We're keeping them separated. It's generally a good practice. It makes it much more obvious to someone who reads your code what's going on. Now we'll re-implement the map reader we previously deleted from imageloader.rs. Only we'll add it as a member function for prefab builder and use the enclosing class features rather than passing map and new depth in and out. So that's going to be in an impl block here. And because this is something we've already written, let's just skim over it real quick. We load in the resource from file, the XP file thing. Um, we go over each layer of the image, which there should only be one based on the images that we have. And we loop over the X and Y cells of the image. And then we get the data from that image. And we say, is it a space or is it a wall? And we set the appropriate tile in the map accordingly. That's all there is to it. Pretty simple. We did that before. And the text that says basically is the same. This is pretty straightforward. More or less a direct port of the one from the wave function collapse chapter. Now let's start making our build function. So the main differences here is it's now self.map. Um, and what was the other one we were referencing? Um, the depth. So the depth as well, um, we're using that here. No, we're not using that here. I don't. Oh, but we had to pass it in to make a new map, right? So yeah, um, we have this stuff built into our builder now rather than having to pass it around as, as mentioned. So pretty simple. Um, now we're going to get started on the build function. Ooh, this one missed all, pretty much all the syntax. Uh, 
guess they all look kind of like that. Hmm, whatever. Um, build function. Let's see. So we're going to match on the mode. Clippy might be mad about this. Okay, yeah, yeah, we're loading it. So, sorry, I, I, I was looking at something else and it threw me off. So we actually don't need... Yeah, we don't need that reference there. Template is already a reference, so we don't need to make another reference to it. Um, that is in the tutorial text, though. It does have the ampersand, but if we read what Clippy says, it's immediately dereferenced by the compiler. So let's just remove that. Those are some things that you will see in, in Rust code sometimes, and it's really helpful to have a tool telling you, hey, you didn't really need to do that. All right, and this is repeated code from other things now that I'm looking at it. So let's just read over it and not waste time typing it. Um, we start our position at the center of the map by dividing each uh, width and height by two. And we convert that to a start index. And then we loop, do a while loop and look for a tile that is a, um, that is a floor tile. Um, that's all we're doing. Find a starting point, start in the middle and walk left until we find an open tile. That's it. Then we take a snapshot once we've got our starting position there. Basic, we don't need to go over that again. Notice that we've copied over the find starting point code. We'll improve that at some point, but for now it ensures you can play your level. We haven't spawned anything, so you'll be alone in the level. There's also a slightly different usage of match here. We're using the variable in the enum. The code prefab rex level template says match rex level, but with any value of template and make that value available via the name template in the match scope. You could use underscore to match any value, but if you didn't want access to it. Rust's pattern matching system is really impressive. You can do a lot with it. Let's modify our random builder to always call this type of map so we don't have to test over and over in the hopes of getting the one we want. Same as always. Um, I missed the closer, okay. And let's just do that there. Let's be a little lazy about it. And let's run this bad boy. It should be pretty simple. It's the test map, right? So now we go in here and we can run around and there's nothing to do and we'll starve to death one day. I mean, I could just sit here and hold the wait button and we'll starve to death. And there we go. I was about to do like a, should be any moment now, and then it happened. Alrighty, where is my browser? It's on the other monitor. All right, so we did that. If you cargo run now, you should, uh, you can run around the otherwise deserted demo map. I still like the little map face right there. I don't know what you call that face, but I like it. Um, populating the test map. By the way, I apologize if there's, uh, if you notice this lag with my cursor. This is something I need to look into, but it's not unique to this browser or what I'm doing. I've noticed it's happening in, in games when I'm moving the mouse. It happened in Caves of Cut, of all things, which is not a an intensive game. Um, if, if I start moving my mouse, you see it starts to stutter a little bit. It like locks up for just a moment and it's when I'm moving my mouse, there's something interesting going on there and I'm not sure what it is. I, I should spend time today after this updating OBS. That might help. I should reboot the machine. That might help. Um, so populating the test map with prefabbed entities. Let's pretend that our test map is some sort of super duper end game map. 
We'll take a copy and call it WFC Populated.xp, then we'll splat a bunch of monster and item glyphs around it. The color coding is completely optional, but I put it for clarity. You'll see we have an, uh, an at to indicate the player's start, the right caret or the greater than sign to indicate the exit, and a bunch of G goblins, O orcs, exclamation mark potions, percent sign rations, and caret traps. Not too bad a map, really. So we'll add this to our resources folder and extend Rex assets to load it. Now, we may already have that. WFC populated is here, so we, we can't really read it. Um, open anyway. Built-in text editor. Yep, not very useful. Um, we have extensions that can help with XP files. Can we just... No, that's not the kind of XP we're looking for. <laughs> All right. Let's close that. I was just curious. Okay. So let's... Actually, we need to go back in there. And we need to go to our loader. Rex assets. So we already included that. I downloaded that last time when we got the other um, WFC stuff. I was like, oh, that looks similar um, that looks like something we're going to want, so I'll get it, just so I can have it for later. So we're going to do this for both of these, and it's going to be WFC populated. Um, and that's all we actually have to do right now, I believe. Should be fine. WFC-populated. Beautiful. Okay. The name demo one is defined. Hold on. Oh, I missed this. My bad. There we go. So because it's a macro, it was able to do some checks and uh, get mad at us, which is nice. We also want to be able to list our spawns that are required by the map. So we're going to go to spawner.rs. It's been a minute since we've been in here. We've established, uh, we have an established tuple format for how we pass spawns, so we'll use it in the struct. Um, so we're adding... Oh, no, my bad. It was just mentioning if we look in here, the way we pass our spawns is... Let's find that tuple. Um, this right here. The U size and string. So we want to mimic that in our prefab builder, right? So in our prefab builder... So we're going to add that there, and then we have to make sure this dude's happy. And there we have it. Simple enough. So to make use of the function in spawner.rs that accepts this type of data, we are going to make it public. So it's going to be spawn entity. And then we'll modify prefab builder spawns prefab builders spawn entities function to make use of this. So in here, we have this empty spawn entities. And that should do it. Pretty simple. I, I don't really think there's much to say here. We pack the type of data that we need into this vector. And then for each thing in the vector, we simply say spawn entity. Not really much going on here. It's pretty simple. As Although this was a really long and beefy section, it's a lot of refactoring and it's a lot of pretty straightforward refactoring. So we're uh, not going to take nearly as long as I thought we might. So let's see. We do a bit of a dance with references just to work with the previous function signature and not change it, which would change lots of other code. So far, so good. It reads the spawn list and requests that everything in the list be placed onto the map. Now would be a good time to add something to the list. 
we want to modify our load rex map to handle new data. Now, this is where it gets a little more interesting. So load rex map. We have a couple different matches here. So we're going to want one for the at sign. And we're going to want one for the greater than the right caret, so G O caret percent exclamation. And then we'll have the default. So let's do at greater G O um, caret percent exclamation. And a lot of this is going to be very much the same. So for this, it's going to be, this one's actually probably the most unique one. We set that to a floor and we make it the starting position. All right. Simple enough. We already have our X and Y from looping through the image. So we just set those for our starting position and we set that tile to floor. Really easy, right? Now here. We have downstairs. Pretty easy, right? Now, if there's an enemy here, there must be a floor. And there we have it. Now, if a goblin can spawn that way, so can an orc, and so can a trap, and so can a ration, and so can a health potion. So goblin, orc. Was it called bear trap? I guess it was. Rations, because the string does matter, right? Health potion. And then if all else fails, And it's going to be cell.ch, I would guess. Yeah, but we have to convert it. So it's going to be as you ate, as care. So I have to do a double uh, conversion there. Uh, what is the cell.ch? It's a U32, but they should be ASCII characters. So we can safely convert that to a U8, and then a U8 can be converted into an actual character. A little bit of roundabout stuff there, and that's a lot of closing, <laughs> a lot of closing uh, parentheses there. All right, so I think this is also fairly straightforward. If you understand how the matching on the space and the pound sign works, then you understand all the rest, right? If we have an at sign in our prefabricated map, that's where we start. So we set our starting position and stuff. If we have the downstairs symbol, which is the right caret, I do like saying that more than greater than, even though it's not really a, an official term, um, it's downstairs. If it's a goblin, then they have to be on the floor and just, in, you know, just make sure we set that tile correctly, right? Because the thing is, the only time we set something to floor or wall is when it's that specific tile. So we still have to make sure we set all the others to floors or walls, right? Um, now, what's interesting here is we're not setting anything in this failure case. We could default it to a wall or something, but that's fine. Um, so in, in every case where we're spawning something, we put it on the floor and we just say what we're spawning. Pretty easy. So let's take a look back at the text here, and we're almost halfway done, apparently. 
This recognizes the extra glyphs and prints a warning to the console if we've loaded one we forgot to handle. Note that for entities, we're setting the tile to floor and then adding the entity type. That's because we can't overlay two glyphs on the same tile, but it stands to reason that the entity is standing on a floor. Lastly, we need to modify our build function to not move the exit in the player. We simply wrap the fallback code in an if statement to detect if we've set a starting position. We're going to require that if you set a start, you also set an exit. Okay, so let's take a look at how we we do that. Um, so find a starting point, and we're going to start with... Um, If self dot starting position dot x is zero. Oh, then I think we're just basically doing a lot of the same stuff. Let's take a look at it. So if self dot starting position dot x is zero, then we do the same thing. We do a start index, we do the while loop, and then we we do take that snapshot. And this is stuff we've done before, right? And that's good. We'll take another snapshot. Why did I space that? My brain was like, underscore is space. And there we have it. We've done this before. Nothing special. We remove unreachable areas, we call the map, right? And then we place stairs at the furthest place. But we only do that if we had no starting position. So we are making an assumption that we do have, that we do have stairs. If our prefab map builder, um, okay, let me, let me, if the person building that XP map that we're reading in, forgot to put stairs, then we're in trouble. So we can cargo run and take a look at it. I need to change the template. What was it called? I think populated. Why are we mad? That's correct. WFC populated. Take a look at our resources. WFC dash populated dot XP. How is this template being used again? We're pulling it into here. We're loading it. Okay, so in main, We're trying to access this map gen in map gen index. So map gen index, this is all the, the history stuff. Interesting. Like we have snapshots, but they're not Something's wrong. Mm. 
Yeah. Panic to index out of bounds. The len is zero, but the index is zero. And let's look back at that again. So it's using map gen history. Which is actually, let's go back to that. Okay, so map gen history. We empty it, right? If the map gen index is greater or equal to the history.len, we get the next state. It's been a while since we've looked at this stuff. What am I missing here? What are we doing that's... Oh! We're not taking a snapshot in the case where we don't have a starting position. That's simple. You know what's actually kind of funny is... That's a bug on the tutorial. Oh, no, it's not. There's a snapshot up here. Okay. We snapshot at the beginning there. But it's also a bug in the tutorial that we shouldn't be going out of bounds like that. Excuse me, I had to sneeze. Yeah, it's a bit of a bug there, um, because I don't think... I think we should be doing bounds checks. There, There's actually an article that popped up recently about how expensive are rust bound checks and it was like basically negligible like you could do bounds checking on like every access and you're pretty much fine it was very 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 negligible now i mean you could argue in a hot loop in a game or something maybe i'd like to see it benchmarked um but we could also do things maybe i don't know the way that loop is set up, we might re-architect some of it and, and use iterators a bit more or something to avoid having to worry about indices because that's what leads to those problems. But we have it now, so we're good. No more bug, no more crash. Simple snap. See, forgetting not taking a snapshot shouldn't break the break the game, right? That's just kind of my point. So now. Rex free prefabs. It's possible that you don't like Rex paint. Don't worry, I won't tell Kaiserati. Maybe you're on a platform that doesn't support it, or maybe you just like to not have to rely on an external tool. We'll extend our reader to also support string output for maps. This will be handy later when we get to small room prefabs slash vaults. I cheated a bit and opened the populated XP in uh, file in Rex and typed Control T to save in text format. That gave me a nice notepad friendly map file. I also realized that Prefab Builder was going to outgrow a single file. Fortunately, Rust makes it pretty easy to turn a module into a multi-file monster. In Map Builders, I made a new directory called Prefab Builder. I then moved prefabbuilder.rs into it and renamed it mod.rs. The game compiles and runs exactly as before. Make a new file in your Prefab Builder and name it prefablevel.rs. Game uh, will paste in the map definition and decorate it a bit. All right, it's a lot of stuff to do but it's going to be, seems like another quick-ish thing. Torn on, like, let's make prefab here. No, never mind. Let's put it somewhere else. Torn on that. It does simulate a bit more of how you might really do this, but it's also annoying. I'll we'll take Prefab Builder and just scooch it in there. Some things are going to get mad, I, I assume, but we'll be okay.
Um, oh, you renamed it to mod, my bad. So we'll delete that. Okay, yeah, we're good then. And then we're going to need the prefab levels, so we'll do that after we confirm this. Go. All right, next, um, we're going to make this prefab levels.rs in here. So it seems like it's going to be some uh, like hard-coded strings and stuff that are our levels. Um, we're going to want to bring that in here. And... Plop this stuff in here. So let's take a look at it. Um, this map looks okay. Now we have to make sure that, that this is all the correct sizing and everything, so we'll talk about that. Um, so let's take a look at it. We have the prefab level with the template width and height. So I, I guess I should have typed this one out because I, I thought it was the same. When I said we'll paste in the map definition, by map definition I think they meant the stuff here. I think this is what they meant. Oh, okay. My bad. Well, we'll break it down anyway, though. It's not a big deal. It's just a couple definitions. Um, so we have prefab level again with template, which is the static string, um, a width and a height. I think that's all very self-explanatory. Um, we have WFC populated as a um, prefab level, and it's constant, public constant. And it takes level map, which is this constant string we have down below. We'll look at it in a moment. Um, and we have width and height of 80 and 43. So if we were to count these here, if we look at the bottom, it says 45. Um, no, no, my bad, I was looking at the wrong thing. Yeah, 79 selected. And then if we were to go, how many rows this is, um, 31 selections, that doesn't seem right. I was assuming there would be 43 height. We got like the 80 width, but our height seems weird. That's like 30, yeah. Line 15 to line um, 45. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, maybe that's fine, but it seems a little odd to me just at the initial glance. But yeah, we basically just have a text defined map. We could do whatever we want here. I could go in here and I could replace this character with another health potion, right? And then all that's going to be read in by our, our builder. So the breakdown here in the text is that we start by defining a new struct type, prefab level, holds a map template, a width, and a height. Then we make a constant WSC populated and create an always available level definition in it. Lastly, we paste our notepad file into a new constant, currently called my level. This is a big string and will be stored like any other string. Let's modify the mode to also allow this type. So here we have rex level. We're going to have constant. So we could actually get rid of this here, I guess. We'll modify the build function. Also use it. And it's just going to be, that's not what we need though. I don't, 
Ignore me. I was looking at two things at once, and I started typing the wrong thing, so my apologies. I was like, what am I doing? Level's already a ref, so I'm going to remove the ampersand there. Oh, no, we actually... Oh, because level is coming in... Prefab level. Oh, we're okay. I see why. We're actually doing something different. It's not Rex map, it's load ASCII map. So we're going to need a new function. We're going to need to modify our constructor to use it as well. And then we'll get to that ASCII map. So basically, let's just look at what we did here, though. Prefab, we're matching on prefab constant. We pick out the level, and then we feed that level to load ASCII map, which we haven't written yet. So where is our new? Um, are we just changing? The, yeah, we're just changing the hard-coded mode for now. So instead of the um, Rex level constant, and then this is called level, and it's going to be... Prefab levels, no. Pull that in. Maybe I was missing it in the other autocomplete, but we got it anyway. It's good, right? So now we're good to pull that in, but we don't have the, the ASCII map yet. So we're going to create a loader that can handle it. We'll modify load rex map to share some code with it. So we aren't typing everything repeatedly, and then we'll make our new load ASCII map function. So we're gonna need a couple of things. We're gonna need um, care to map. So this match statement can basically go away. Well, we're gonna move it. Where's the end of it? Put some marker there. And we're going to have fn care to map. And we're going to do match ch. And we need to do these x and y values. Also, going to say ch as u8 as care. And then here, we're going to have to do these x and y values. So we're going to say let x equal idx as i32 mod self.map.width. Now, if we're doing it this way, be careful. Index as i32 divided by self.map.what? Width, not height. Don't make that mistake. So we have an X and a Y, and we'll do the floor tile, and then we'll do the same code here with X and Y as our starting position. Nothing else has to change there, and that's all we needed for that. So then in here, um, where we get this index, we're going to do self.care to map. Like that. And there is also a comment that we can bring in if we want. We're doing some nasty casting to make it easier to type things like pound sign in the match. So yeah, we just make sure we have it as a character. But we shouldn't need to do that anymore if it's a character. No? What's, um, oh, we need an, another closing. Yeah, uh, I think their example still has this typecasting here, literally converting a character to a U8 and then back into a character. I would guess a compiler might optimize that away and realize, hey, you probably don't want to do that. But, you know, it's 
nice that we can just get rid of that. And uh, so up here again, we just call this self care to map. And we already do our type uh, our uh, typecasting here. And that's about it. So now we want to do the load ASCII map. Which will be here. Uh, whoops, wrong one. Um, go away. Epic notification that pops up on the screen. All right, so we'll pull in a, uh, a prefab level, which obviously makes sense. And we'll convert it to a vector without new lines. I'm guessing the other one's going to be slash n, yeah. Not to scroll over though. So we'll collect it. Um, the way this works, just for a quick uh, explanation, I don't know how much we've used collect. Um, when you have an iterator, you can use collect to pull it into some other kind of collection. I think we have used it a bit. Um, usually you have to define what that collection is going to be. In this case, we've specified the type here as a vec of characters. So it knows what to turn that into, but we could have made it a, a, a map, right? We could have made it a hash set or something. So there's a different ways we could have collected it. Um, we've said collected here into a vector of characters. And what we're all, all we're doing here is we get the big old string that we built, which is right here. We get this big old string. We loop over every character, or we get an iterator over them, right? And then we filter. Anything that's a slash R or slash N, remove it. I don't know what's with these sneezes right now, sorry. Um, anything that's a slash R or slash N, remove. So we're, we're basically saying keep the things that are not slash r and slash n um and that's it collect those back and we have our our uh string vec as we're calling it we're going to mutably iterate over that and then we're going to do this uh conversion here, which I think is going to be tied to what well, we'll see. I think it's going to be tied to something related to the character set we're using. But it looks like if if the character is 160 U8, then we just simply set it to a space, which should be like 32 in ASCII. So I'm not sure what 160 is, but we'll figure it out, I guess. It'll probably be described. All right. Now we're going to make an index i for ty in 0.level.height. I don't really like some of these simple, like, two-letter names and stuff that don't mean a lot. I look at horrible Perl code and stuff all the time at work. And, uh, I mean, I don't like scripting languages in general. Perl is, I'm not a fan of it. It is, a, uh, you know, there's like languages like Python and stuff I'm not a big fan of. And then Perl's just like, hold my beer. I got this. Um, I see stuff like this all the time. And I'm like, dude, I don't know what that is when I just look at it. Why is it called TY and TX? What does that mean?
Okay, what is this funky stuff we're doing here? So we loop over the level's height and width. Now, it is just a... Um, it's just a, a one-dimensional vector. So we're using the map XY index to convert that into an index that we can actually use on our on our real map, basically. Um, but if if TX is less than the width and TY is less than the height, so I think we're just checking for uh, map boundaries at that point. Then we just map the character. That's not too bad. It's just, I don't, I don't understand what the T is for. I'm more okay with X and Y because I know what that means. I don't know what the T is for. Maybe, I, maybe I'd be too, too harsh, too critical, but I don't know what the T is for. It just seems weird to me. I will get stuck on something like that. It just seems very arbitrary. I'm, I'm not seeing anything obvious. So I'm going to just forget about it for now. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that the giant match in load rex map is now a function, care to map. Since we're using the functionality more than once, this is a good practice. Now we only have to fix it once if we messed it up. Otherwise, load rex map is pretty much the same. Our new functions load ASCII map. It starts with some ugly code that bears explanation. Dude, that's not ugly code. I mean, maybe the filter, uh, maybe the stuff in the filter, checking against the two characters is not the most elegant. You could have also fed it in, I think there is a, a function that would uh, remove white space. Take a look at that. I was actually going to comment on that as we did it. Let's see. I mean, we could do like strip or something. So you could do trim works on the start. This is just, yeah, trim is just a start and end. So trim doesn't quite get us what we need. So you could do a replace. Um, it does give you back a string. So you could do a replace if you want. And then you would say from slash R to space. Or no, to nothing. You do that. And then it just remove the character. So you could do something like that. This does to me look more elegant. I, I don't know. I like my iterators and stuff. Um, I don't really think it looks ugly. <laughs> Hang on, is there... Is there a check... Oops. Is there a check on a character? So, let's pretend filter a... star a dot... is... So is ASCII white space? No, but what about... Um, Maybe I'm missing it. I don't see a new line check. But you could do something more like um, not slash r slash n contains um, star a. You should be able to do something like that. Oh, it actually wants the reference, my bad. Um, you can do something like that. I don't know if you think that looks better or worse, but um, if it doesn't, if this thing does not contain the character, then we're good. Basically, you define characters that you don't want, right? Or you, or you know, if you remove the negation, you define characters that you do want. So they take up about the same amount of space. It's up to you what you like more, I guess. All right, so anyway, I got distracted by that. 
So, explanation. So let mute string vec vec care level template cares filter collect is a common rust pattern, but it isn't really self-explanatory at all. I, I don't know. I disagree with that. It chains methods together in left to right order. So it's really a big collection of instructions glued together. I think that's very opinionated on both of our parts, though. They say it's not self-explanatory. I think it is self-explanatory and much more readable. Um, I think it's very... It's, it's kind of in the vein of functional programming where you have things that you want to do and you just give it that list of instructions. I want to get the characters. I want to filter it. I want to collect it. I think that's pretty readable. I think that's a lot more readable... You might have trouble with the filter, but I think those kind of chains are a lot more readable to someone with little programming experience um, than the same person against like some C code or something that does the same thing. I might be wrong, but I think that to me, those chains are pretty readable. Again, I, that's also an opinion though. So um, let mute string vec vec care is just saying make a variable named string vec of the type vec care and let me edit it level dot templates the string in which our level template lives dot cares turns it into an iterator the same as when we've previously typed my vector dot iter and the dot filter is interesting filters take a lambda function in and keep any entries that return true so in this case we're stripping out r and n the two new line characters and we'll keep everything else collect says take the results of everything before me and put them into the vector um, let me let me make that a little more clear so that the exact text here says dot collect says take the results of everything before me and put them into a vector that is semantically correct as to what is happening here in this case because we specified the type as vec care a vector of characters dot collect collects it into a vector of characters but we could have said collect it into a hash set we could say hash set care and it would do just the same into a hash set instead. Um, so collect can work on any number of collections and that's actually critical. It does not always collect into a vector. So I wanna make sure we're clear on that. So um, we then mutably iterate the string vector and turn it into the character, uh, turn the character 160 into spaces. I honestly have no idea why the text is reading spaces as character 160 and not 32, but we'll roll with it and just convert it. <laughs> okay, that could be something to look into, because I mentioned that already myself. We then iterate y from 0 to the specified height. We iterate x from 0 to the specified width. Maybe the t in that was target, target x and target y. If the x and y values are within the map we're creating, we calculate the index for the map tile and call our care to map function to translate it. If you cargo run now, you'll see exactly the same as before, but instead of loading the RexPaint file, we've loaded it from the constant ASCII. If it ever seems like I'm overly harsh on something or I'm very pedantic about certain details, it's, it's just because I'm trying to understand and I'm trying to make sure that, that everybody understands um, what, what's going on with the... Okay, what, do, what did we miss? We're off by one somewhere. Let me make sure I didn't make a slight typo here. Or it could be one other thing. TX and zero to level height. Ah, oh, no, no, yeah, I did them, I did them backwards. I got too worked up on the, um, no, no, those are right. It's height and then width. If TX is less than width and TY is less than height. We get the index with TX and TY. So we're off by one. Notice that the len is 2451, but the index is 2451. Let me do one thing. Make sure I, there's not like a really simple typo here. 
I just copied over with theirs, but I don't see a difference. So I, I know what it may be. My... Doesn't fully line up though. There is a space right here. There is an empty space right there that may have been removed. I think there's some extra stuff that I'm not getting copied with the map. Let me try a slightly different approach here. Why, why are we mad? It contains many invisible Unicode characters. Exactly. Unexpected closing delimiter. Why? Oh, down there. I missed one. Okay. We might be okay now. Oops, and I put a W in here. Okay, let me back up just a little bit. This is when we first... I hit uh, I hit W in, instead of uh, save earlier. I think it filtered those things out. I think the auto format is actually hurting us here. That's a problem, isn't it? So when we pasted this whole thing in... Oh, I know why that was down there. It It's weird, but I know why it was down there. Um, can we, let me go into my preferences, format, format on save, off, All right, let's see what happens. Okay, we've kept it in the same format, I believe. We're still having an issue here. But look at that, the map, the LEN is 33.99 and the index is 33.99. That's way different. And it's happening here when we index into, into string vec. We're literally off by one and why? Why are we off by one? So let's explain what happened here. There are invisible Unicode characters, as it says. So what we were not seeing is when it was formatting, I guess it was removing those, trying to be helpful. And in most cases, that would be helpful. In our case, that's not. In our case, that is breaking, 
our map. Oh, wait a minute. Well, actually, I can explain why we're going out of bounds, but I'm also noticing something else. What? What I'm looking at on my end looks quite a bit different. Oh, it's because it's... Oh, there's some goofy stuff. Okay, I'm gonna go into the source code, copy it from there. I might need to get that, that Rex, uh, that Rex Paint program or something. I hope it's still in the source code. I hope they didn't remove it and put, I mean, if they did put it in a file, that would be easier to work with. But, um, prefab builder, prefab levels. Try copying it from that text. Actually, I might want to view it raw. I don't think that worked. Raw. Recopy that. I I don't know. I think it looks different though. Yes. Okay. So let's explain what's happening here and why I am not a big fan of the current approach. It has potential. I'm actually fine with the ASCII loader, but I'm not a fan of the way it's currently working. So if we, we hit begin, we can go through and do things. It, it, it works, right? It's good. This file is now like off limits and we don't want to ever basically touch it if we're using the ASCII deal. We do not want this map to be formatted. I don't know if we can stop it from being formatted. Um, so I want to take a look at that real quick. Um, Rust stop file from being formatted. How do I exclude a file from being built? Um, that's not it. Let me try one thing. Control Shift F formats. And now if I paste it again, maybe I just wasn't getting everything copied. Maybe we're good now. Yeah, we're good. Okay. It wasn't even the formatting. So we, we will turn the formatting back on. And I think we're good. Format on save. This is not for everybody, but I like it. So I'm hitting save. We're formatted. And I can run it again. And we're good. So there's two problems with what's going on. And they're both pretty straightforward, but interesting. The first one is we are hard coding the width and height of this map. They're, they're both very related to each other, but this is the source, this is the crux of the problem. When we loop over, when we iterate over uh, through the X and Y values, we are defining right here the size of the map. And that means if there's anything wrong with this string here, if there's anything wrong with our map, it will not work, right? Um, in fact, let's click over to the, the tutorial and look at something interesting. If we look here, we see the rations around where my mouse is at, and we go up, we see this here, this like, it's like a hallway going up, and then there's nothing. It stops. That's actually not the entire map. Let's go back over to mine, and we have the percent sign here, the rations. We go up the hallway, and there's the player starting point. What I first copied from the tutorial seems to be incomplete, maybe. There also seem to be potentially some in missing ASCII characters. What's interesting though, is if you looked earlier, I did have an at sign. 
and I was noticing differences between the tutorial text and mine. And I was curious about it. Um, the way I copied it the second time from the tutorial was there is a copy to clipboard button in here. And that actually gives you like a main and everything. So I don't like using it because it, it wraps this whole thing in a main. And that's why a minute ago I had an extra bracket down here at the bottom because that was like closing off the main that that copy added. Um, but when I copied it that way, I did notice that we still had like our at sign and stuff up here, despite not seeing it on the tutorial page. So something about that formatting, despite the fact that it's text and ASCII, something about the formatting there was not good. What I ultimately ended up doing was going over and getting into the source code at the bottom of the page. There's a link to the source for this tutorial. I went to the prefab levels. I found it in here, but I didn't copy it from here. I went over to raw. I copied the raw file and you could see that here it's still highlighted from where I, I copied it. Um, that's what I copied and pasted in and we're good. So there's some ASCII characters or something that were missing when I copied it from here. So because of that, the map that we were trying to generate, the map that we were trying to build with this loop here, we were um, expecting a certain width and height, but we were missing a character or something, and it was causing us to go out of bounds. Now again, I would say, I think it would be better to, um, I think it would be better to do this with some iterators or something in some way. I know when you want an X and a Y value, that gets a little more complex. We're treating a, a 1D array as a 2D array, and we have no way to know what the X and Y values are in that case. We need to know the you know the width of a of a row essentially, so that gets a little more complex. But you know you, you tend to want to prefer to use things like iterators. Um, I'm wondering if it would not have worked to simply use the index of this. If this is the same map that we've been using all along, I wonder why we couldn't simply use the index and enumerate an iterator. But that may not be valid in this case. Um, anyway, that was the issue. Very odd case here where copying that string, which of course I wasn't going to type that myself, right? I wasn't going to type that big old level string. And I don't expect anyone else to. My next option would be I could literally go get the, Rex, the XP file loaded into that program, which I don't have. So I'd have to go get the program as well and export it myself. That would have been the, the other option. But um, yeah, this is a fun one. You gotta, you gotta watch that. You gotta be careful with stuff like that. So I would say it would be nice to look into more safe ways of doing this that are less prone to, if you missed a character, the whole thing fails. All right, so let me get back to where we were at on the text. If we cargo run, you'll see exactly the same as before, but instead of loading the Rex Paint file, we loaded it from the constant ASCII in prefab level.rs. So now, building a level section, your brave adventurer emerges from the twisting tunnels and comes across the walls of an ancient underground fortification. That's the stuff of great D&D stories, and also an occasional occurrence in games such as Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. It's quite likely that what actually happened is your brave adventurer emerges from a procedurally generated map and finds a level section prefab. We'll extend our mapping system to explicitly support this. A regular builder makes a map and then a sectional prefab replaces part of the map with your existing pre-made content. We'll start by making a new file and place a description of what we want. So we have more ASCII to copy and I'm going to copy that in the same way that we saw a minute ago. Even though it looks simpler, I'm going to be copying this ASCII from the raw files from now on to make sure we don't run into an issue like that again. So what is this new file we want? In prefab builder, we want prefab sections.rs. Now, these are gonna be pretty simple. Um, I'm going to copy our um, initial definitions here because I don't feel like typing out the derives, if I'm being honest. 
Um, and they're very simple. We have an enum of a horizontal placement, left, center, and right. Vertical placement, top, center, and bottom. We have a struct called prefab section, which has a template similar to before, a width and a height similar to before, and a placement, which just says whether it's going to be horizontal or vertical. So if we can imagine that we've split our map into a three by three grid, we have top center bottom rows and we have uh, left center right columns, right? And that gives us a three by three grid where we can mix and match. We can say top left, top center, top right, uh, center left, center, um, center, center right, and so on. So that gives us different places we can put these prefabs. So now we're gonna have pub const underground port. It's prefab section. Template. Right fort. Width is 15. Height is 43. And placement is the tuple. Horizontal placement, vertical placement. And now we need the right fort um, prefab thing in here. I know we haven't used this anywhere, so we're not getting any syntax stuff, but that's okay. So I'm gonna go back over here and I'm gonna look for that file. Um, prefab sections. We may be adding more. Um, wow, that's a lot more than what we see here. Are we expanding it later? I don't see it being expanded later. So let's take a look at this real quick. Here's what we see in the tutorial. We see this little section here. That's all. Take a look at the, at the file here, however. Quite a bit different. So I'm just going to copy this as is. Yeah, because this is 43 high. So I'm going to copy that. It's already pasted into our file here. Hopefully that's going to make everything happy. Um, I hope we don't run into more of those issues. But uh, I, think, I think we're good now. So we have right fort as a string. Describing a fortification we might encounter. We built a structure prefab section which includes placement hints and a constant for our actual fort, underground fort, specifying that we'd like to be at the right of the map at the top. The vertical doesn't really matter in this example because it's the full, map, the full size of the map. Level sections are different from builders we've made before because they take a completed map and replace part of it. We've done something similar with wave function collapse, so we'll adopt a similar pattern. We'll start by modifying our prefab builder to know about the new type of map decoration. All right, so... Um, prefab builder and we're gonna go to the prefab mode and I guess this is going to take in the existing level perhaps no no not it's sectional sectional um, section prefab sections prefab section now we need to go ahead and add that mod and we're good there so now we're going to go to the prefab builder and we're going to take in a previous builder similar to wave function collapse. This is what we used previously and then we can use that to replace part of the map, right? That's exactly what we were describing. So, um, the tutorial says, as much as I'd love to put the previous builder into the enum, I kept running into lifetime problems. Perhaps there's a way to do it and some kind of reader will help me out. But for now, I've put it into prefab builder. I actually, yeah, I thought we were going to do that. So we'll, we'll maybe look into that and explore it or something. The requested map section is in the parameter. However, we also update our constructor to use this type of map. So constructor... previous builder, and we're going to have to uh, take that in as an argument. All right, that looks good to me right now. And 
Um, I think we're good. But we, we actually want to make sure this does it too, though. Don't forget. So it's going to be... And this becomes sectional. No, 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 no. <laughs> A little bit too helpful there, Mr. Autocomplete. Okay. So over in Map Builder's Mod RS, Random Builder, we'll modify the builder to first run a cellular automata map, then apply the sectional. So we're going to go over here. We're going to do this. Um, build that, yeah. So we're boxing up the prefab builder, and then inside of that, we're boxing a cellular automata. So we're kind of going in and out. Uh, uh, from, from here, we're working outward a little bit. Um, oh, I missed those. What are they? Um, I missed those. And then over here, you are mad because of what? Oops. We're not matching on that yet. So down here, um, they also say, by the way, the, um, the deal here could be one line, but I separated out due to sheer number of parentheses. Well, in my case, this is how the auto formatter does it, which is fine. So here, um, add in the sectional and apply sectional with the section that we found, the prefab section. So that tells us what we're going to have to do next, right? We're going to make an apply sectional function. I'll put it right above build. And it'll take in a prefab section, pretty standard stuff. Build the map. We'll get a mutable reference to the previous builder, and we're just doing an unwrap, so it's not very safe. We assume it's going to be there, um, so, you know, I guess it's fine. But previous builders, like, it is an optional. I think it'd be better to, to, to check. Whatever, whatever, it's fine. That's basically... The problem I have with this code, let's let's be a little critical here. The problem I have with this code is we assume that previous builder has something in it. But if it doesn't, and how do we get to that point? We only apply sectional if we go here. But we don't have any way to enforce that if we're in the prefab mode, we also enforce that we actually do in fact have a previous builder. Previous builder is still passed in as optional. And while we're hard coding the mode right here, if that mode can change, I don't see yet how this is safe. Um, so we're basically getting back to old like null issues at that point by just assuming, hey, get it. Let's hope it works. So just trying to call attention to that there. You'd, you'd probably want to do some error checking to make sure that it actually does have a previous builder. So we build map from the previous builder, um, and then starting position, prebuilder.get starting position, self.map is prebuilder.getmap.clone, self.take snapshot. And then we're gonna use prefab sections, everything,
read ASCII to VAC. Um, is that a new function? Same as the string to vector code from the level example. We've also we've actually updated. Okay, cool. Thank you for doing that and not tell. Let's <laughs> do this refactor yourself, I guess. Okay. I understand what it is, but it's like, okay, that's just that's a little goofy. All right, so we're going to place the section. Um, so we're going to do chunk X. Selection.placement.zero. Um, or section. I was trying to figure out what is selection. So now we're going to put in our arms here. So for left... We're going to say chunk X is zero. For center... Okay, and then I'm going to copy this and just modify it a little bit. So there's going to be self.map.width minus one. We go to the far edge of the map and then do minus section.width as I32. So these make sense to me, but I want to make sure we understand how this works. As a, as a group, as a whole here. So we have a section that we're placing, um, which is our, our prefab thing, right? And it has a width. Let's say it is um, nine tile, let's, let's, that's a big number. Let's say it is, I mean, it's not that big, but let's say it's three tiles wide. There is an exact center point, which would be the second tile right or you can say you know if it's an odd number it's really easy you know if it's five tiles then the midpoint is three right so what we're actually doing here is we're saying if we want to place it on the left we just start at zero if we want to place it in the middle we get the middle of the map and then we actually move left by half of the width so what we're saying is if that thing is five tiles wide we move over by like three or whatever. I mean, in this case, we get the weird integer division, but we're moving over by half of the width. That way, the center of our section thing is at the center tile. That's the idea. And then here we have to move, if we're on the right side of the map, we have to move all the way over so the far right side of our section is on the far right of the map. We're going to repeat this for chunk Y. So we're going to get section.placement.1 and it's going to be very much identical. So very, very much the same. Um, map height over two, section height minus section height as I32 over two. We're getting that center point vertically now. And then we do the same thing where if we're at the bottom of the map, we have to go up um, so that the bottom of our section is at the very bottom of the map, right? So hopefully not too big of a deal. Print line. It's going to be a lot of prints, but I guess we're okay with that. Oh, whoops. 
Um, so we print, now we're setting up this I index. We're going to do this, another, this TY thing again in TX. And we're just checking to see if it's in the boundaries of the map. We're going to get an XY index. And we're going to use the uh, chunk size as well as an offset, right? Care to map. With string vec i and idx. We'll take a snapshot at the end of that. Now we need to make read ASCII to vec. So what I can do is go find the other one. I guess we also want to do this this here. So if I try to refact, uh, not this, um, refactor. So now I've, I've just essentially ripped out the filter stuff and the modifying of the, um, the characters 160 into spaces. And we return that as a string vec, well, which is a vector of characters. So now if we go up here, read ASCII to vec. Um, don't you see it? Except, ooh, we got a problem there. Okay, that's what it is. So instead of level dot template in here, we're going to say it is the anster, and we're going to say level. And now we'll come up here where it's mad. I mean, this is me refactoring on my own at this point. Level dot template. Now that's happy. Now we can come down here, and why are you not happy? Not found for prefab builder in the current scope. Why do you see it? Did I type something wrong? Oh, this prefab builder thing. That might be okay. Um, I might have done mine a little bit differently. I didn't make it part, I didn't make it a, a, a member, essentially, but it might be okay. Yep, there we go. We saw it pop up on the map already. So we did a cellular automata map, right? And then over here, we have this fortification that we built up, which is pretty cool. I like it, all righty. It 
fits pretty well with that, doesn't it? All right. So let's walk through this and we'll talk about the little refactor that I did because it was kind of left up to the to the reader, to the viewer. So this is a lot like other code we've written, but let's step through it anyway. Let prev builder equal self.previous builder as mute.unwrap is quite the mouthful. The previous builder is an option, but we're calling this code if we're calling this code, it has to have a value. So we want it to unwrap, which will panic and crash if there is no value, but we can't. The borrow checker will complain if we just call previous builder.unwrap. So we have to inject an as mute in there, which option provides just for this purpose. We call build map on the previous builder to construct the base map. We copy the starting position from the previous builder to our new builder. We copy the map from the previous builder to our new to ourself, the new builder. And we call read ASCII to vec, which is the same as the string to vector code from the level example. We've actually updated the level example to use it also in the source code. We create two variables, chunk X and chunk Y, and query the section's placement preference to determine where to put the new chunk. We iterate the section just like when we were iterating a level earlier, but adding chunk X to TX and chunk Y to TY to offset the section in the level. The cargo run, you see a map built with the cave and a fortification to the right, which is what we just witnessed ourselves. Pretty cool stuff. I like it. Um, let me rerun it one time. Oh, my bad. Didn't mean to do that when I did. Let me rerun it one time. I want to see. Yeah, ours looks the same. Okay. I was seeing some corridors and I was like, does ours look different? Yeah, no, that's the same. Yeah. Cool. All right, let me get the browser back. Oh, it's gonna get funky for a second, hold on. All right. You may also notice that there aren't any entities at all outside of the prefab area. So we're gonna add entities to sectionals. Spawning and determining spawn points have been logically separated to keep to help keep the map generation code clean. Different maps can have their own strategies for placing entities, so there isn't a straightforward method to simply suck in the data from the previous algorithms and add to it. There should be, and it should enable filtering and all manner of tweaking with later meta map builders, such as uh, wave function collapse or this one. We've stumbled upon a clue for a good interface in the code that places entities in prefabs. The spawn, in, the spawn system already supports tuples of position and type string, so we'll use that as the basis for the new setup. So we'll open up map builders mod.rs and, and edit the map builder trait. Oh no. <laughs> That's gonna break everything. It depends on how we edit it. Um, this one here, the map builder. Um, oh, we're just doing a default spawn entities, aren't we? Doing a couple things. So first, we have build map, get map, get starting position, get snapshot history, take snapshot, and get spawn list. Now we also have spawn entities, and we can do this. Get the spawn list dot iter. Spawn entity ECS and entity zero and one, just like that. We wrote that earlier, so that's the same code. And now we need to do get spawn list. <laughs> the tutorial says, Congratulations, half your source code just turned red in your IDE. That's the danger of changing a base interface. You wind up implementing it everywhere. Also, the setup of spawn entities has changed. There's now a default implementation. Implementers of the trait can override it if they want to, but otherwise they don't actually need to write it anymore. Since everything should be available via the get spawn list function, the trait has everything it needs to provide that implementation. So we'll go back to simple map and update it to obey the new trait rules. We'll extend the simple map builder and going to be a bunch of stuff here, so just bear with me, all righty. Um, simple map. And 
simple map builder, we're going to want spawn list. And in here, we're going to need the new function, get spawn list. Oops, put me an extra one there. And we just return a reference to the spawn list. Very easy. Now for the fun part. Previously, we didn't consider spawning until the call to spawn entities. Let's remind ourselves what it does. It's been a while. So spawn entities, let's just look at the code here. Spawn entities loops over all the rooms and spawns for the room. It iterates all the rooms and spawns and spawns entities inside the rooms. Literally, I was reading it from the code and summarizing what I was reading, and now it says almost the same thing. Uh, we're using that pattern a lot, so it's time to visit spawn room in spawner.rs. We'll modify it to spawn into a spawn list rather than directly onto the map. So we open up spawner.rs and we modify it to spawn into a um where you go. Oh, no, so we open up spawner.rs and modify spawn room and spawn region since they're intertwined. We'll fix them together. So spawn room. Didn't expect all this. So it fills a room with stuff and let mute possible targets, boroscope. Um, the map is no longer being done the same way. So we have for y in room dot y1 plus uh, plus one. Oh yeah, I was mis it's a range, but I was reading it strangely. So from y1 plus one to uh, room y2, x is the same. Uh, let index equal map x y index. If map dot tiles. Wait, where is our map coming from then? Oh, we're passing it in. So yeah, this is changing a lot. Let me take room and map depth. And we take that um, spawn list as well. So now at the end here, spawn region is map RNG, possible targets map depth and spawn list. Now spawn region needs some work as well. So the first thing is map and map RNG. Random number generator area we already have. Map depth, and then we need spawn list. And now in here, we do the spawn table, spawn points, and areas. Get rid of that. And num spawns, if number spawns, okay, that looks fine. I'm very quickly skimming this. For spawn in spawn points dot iter, we do spawn list. Did I miss one? No, we're good. Okay. So there we go. Basically, we just uh, put them in the list, and then later on, that list can be spawned. So you'll notice the biggest change is taking a mutable reference to the spawn list in each function and instead of actually spawning the entity we defer the operation by pushing the spawn information into the spawn list vector at the end. 
Instead of passing in the ECS, we're passing in the map and the random number generator. Going back to simple map, we remove the we move the spawning code into the end of build. We'll need that, and then this is going to need some work. Okay, so where are we? I was just double checking some things. Starting position. Now we spawn. So spawner spawn room and self dot map and mute rng room self dot depth and mute self dot spawn list we can now delete their implementation of spawn entities and the default will work fine same changes can be made to all the builders that rely on room spawning. For brevity, I won't spell them all out here. You can find them in the source code. The various builders that use the Voronoi diagrams are similarly simple to update. For example, Cellular Automata. Cellular Automata. We will um, add the spawn list to the builder structure. And I already forgot what it is. It's a vec of u size and string. Yeah, I'm going to get tired of typing that one. I already have actually. So do that. Move the monster spawning from spawn entities. and delete spawn entities, right? We need get um, spawn list as well. Don't do the double ref. <laughs> okay. Wrong thing. Got it. Oh, yeah, I don't need yeah, I don't need the type for it anyway. Um So in build We generate noise areas and then for area in self.noiseareas.iter, we spawn region and it's self.map. Oh, I broke it. Area one, self.depth. And then and mute self dot spawn list. Once again, it's rinse and repeat on the other Voronoi spawn algorithms, and they've done all the work in the source code, so we could take a peek if we want, or we could do this. Oh my goodness! BSP is pretty easy, right? Um, let's go copy this so I don't have to keep typing it.
Where is the... Um... Here it is. Remove spawn entities. Where are we calling spawn entities? That's the one thing I, I guess I'm missing at the moment. Right, return spawn list. And at the end of build, how does spawning work here? Why do I not feel like I'm seeing any spawn code? Oh, we don't need it here, do we? We already have rooms. We don't need to... Do we need to... Hang on. We do need something, don't we? We're not populating the spawn list anywhere. Yeah, so we need to move that down down into here. So we could say um for room in self dot rooms dot iter dot skip one that do it yeah so we're gonna need this in bsp interior as well We're going to get rid of, we're going to add the spawn list. Everything else there should be the same. So down here, we get rid of spawn entities. I could have just copied that. That's what I need to do. Um, that's what I was messing up. That'll make it quicker. So here it'll be what? Um, hold on. <laughs> My brain was just overloaded for a moment there. All the other ones are Voronoi based, aren't they? So Maze Builder. Take a spawn list and Copy that. We'll spawn things. Um, it's uh, is that it? Yeah, but we're not done here. I also have to sneeze again. Now in here, we will implement this. Simple enough. Voronoi. You're fun.
All right, so we need the spawn list. And then in these, we need spawn list. There, so we can just do that. Voronoi is happy. In mod, um, not that mod. That mod. Oh no, not that mod. <laughs> that mod. I was just double checking, looking at something. Um, DLA Builder. We need another spawn list. What did I last copy? Eh, it's close, but not it. Now we need this for multiple constructors. That saved a lot of effort there. Take this loop, delete this, bring in this, and look for the Voronoi regions. Self.map and mute RNG. And then at the end, we add um, the spawn list. Lots and lots of refactors, but they're going okay. They're not great, but they could be a lot worse. So we have that, and we have... Oh, nope. Um... The new vac. I'll copy this with the new line so I can just go right there, plop that in, and plop that in, plop that in, plop that in, and that. That was most of the red in this file. Now we're going to need that. Delete that. Bring this in. Self.spawn list. It gives me a ref auto magically. And where's the Voronoi regions down at the bottom here? And same thing. It is a reference to self.map, mutable reference to RNG, and mutable reference to self.spawn list. Drunkard is happy now. And we are right here at the tail end of this ugly, ugly refactor. Have that. Go ahead and copy that. Self.spawn list. Skip down to the Voronoi stuff, get it out of the way. Um, Self.map. RNG and self.spawn list, and then a couple constructors, or no, just one in this case, right? Okay, now for the prefab builder. Um, it's gonna be like the same code, but we gotta just do a little bit more manual, don't we? Spawns here is our spawn list. So let's do that for um, consistency across all of the builders. And we have spawn entities, but we can delete that.
And here we do self.spawn list. And we build up the spawns for that. I think that's it. Yeah, because next it's going to describe how to use it. Um, so something else is red in spawner. Um, can't borrow RNG as mutable. Did we make a new one? No. So there's a... Bindings already, yeah, so we don't need to do that. We just need to do that, right? Yeah. That's an oddity in Rust. That is one thing I do find weird. Um, it's already a mutable reference, so we don't need to do and mute here. Um, you sometimes see that, and it can feel a little odd. So I think that's okay. What I'm confused about, and what I want to double check now, is where spawn entities is being called. Builder.spawn entities here. Okay, so there that's all we needed to know. So we generate a map and that gets our builder and our builder spawns. I just wanted to make sure it's been so long since we've dealt with that stuff that it, it we have to make sure that it's working correctly. So what I did there just kind of automatically makes it work. That's the that's literally the take home from that is uh, what we just did automatically makes it work because we're already calling the spawn entities and we now made it a default implementation so we don't have to do that for every single one anymore. Um, all we have to do is have the, the code to, to populate the list and then they'll spawn when they're supposed to. So um, here we go. Back to the tutorial. We're almost done. We're at the very, very, very tail end now. Um, so it says jump to here if refactoring is boring. Well, we just did it. You watched me do a refactor. It wasn't great, but it wasn't the worst thing in the world. Once you figure out the first couple, and that was the the joy of doing that, actually. I found it a little bit enjoyable because the first one was like, what in the world? Because I'm following the tutorial. And then from there, it's like, oh, but I'm doing it myself and I'm getting used to it and I understand what I'm doing better. So there was some benefit to that. Um, so... Now that we've refactored our spawn system, how do we use it inside Prefab Builder? We can add one line to our apply sectional function and get all the entities from the previous map. You could simply copy it, but that's probably not what you want. You need to filter out entities inside the new Prefab, both to make room for new ones and to ensure that the spawning makes sense. We'll also need to rearrange a little to keep the borrow checker happy. So here's the function now. So apply sectional is here, and let's take a look at it. Um, oh yeah, we're, we're doing this thing too, um, where this is uh, how I like to write my Rust, usually. Um, that's fine. So what we would do here, instead of saying it equals that, we remove the equality. We did this before. But sometimes if I'm just writing the code, uh, following the tutorial, I, I won't make as many changes. Although if you've been watching, you know I do like to throw my two cents in from time to time. So remove the chunk blah equals, remove that from there, remove that from there, and we'll put a semicolon on the end of that. And now, honestly, it looks way cleaner to me. That was written a little bit more like some C style code, which is fine. I prefer to write C over something like Java, but um, this is Rust. We can do nicer things like this. Um, let, you know, declare it and initialize it all in one go. Um, okay, so now use prefab sections. Oh, it's quite a bit different. Previous builder stuff is moved, so I'm gonna Yoink that, and it's happening after um, chunk Y. That print is now gone as well. That was probably there for debugging. It got left in the tutorial. 
Okay, so let's start at the top now. Let's pre use for prefab sections. Uh, we do the string vec with section.template. So it looks like I did my refactor similar to how they did theirs. Or no, apply sectional is the one where we first saw this, right? I think, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, we get chunk X and Y, none of that should change. We build the map, so let previous builder, um, and we do build map, set start, uh, self dot starting position and map. Then instead of taking a snapshot right away, for E in prev builder dot get spawn list dot iter, let index equal E dot zero, let X equal index as i32 mod self.map.width. Now remember, what's the trick to this? You always think width and height, but in this case, if you're doing the mod and divide technique to do the, to convert the index, you use width on both. So we're doing some basic bounds checking here. Pretty straightforward stuff. We'll talk about it in a moment though. We don't need a semicolon there. I'll put one. It's actually not in the tutorial though. So we don't need it. Um, does get map already clone? Or it's going to clone by default, right? Yeah. I think. Get map. Is there a reason we don't have that as a default thing? Seems like a, an easy one to do. So a lot of these seem like easy ones to do. Let's take a look at Drunkard and get map. Yeah, we're already cloning map, so Flippy is correct. It's a redundant clone. We don't need to do a clone here. I mean, Clippy, I'm going to say Clippy is usually correct. You might not agree with some suggestions, but when it tells you you're doing something redundant or whatever, it's I don't think I've ever seen it be incorrect. I mean, it's a, it's a linter. It, it, it knows what it's doing. So I, I just want to see it for myself and why it was redundant. So we're already cloning that. So if we use git map, we don't clone it. Um, but that was in the tutorial text from earlier. Um, it's actually gone now. Now that I'm looking at it, it's... Oh, no, it's still here. Never mind. Yeah, let's look at it self.map and it does get map.clone that was a quick glimpse uh okay so here we say um we get the x y values if x is less than chunk x or if it's greater than chunk x plus the width of the chunk so what we're saying is essentially x has to be outside of the x values or outside of the Y values. And that's enough to indicate that it's not inside of the chunk, right? If it's to the left or the right, or if it's below or above, then it can't be in the chunk. So in that case, we push things, we push those spawns into the spawn list. And that's how we keep our old spawns that we got from the existing map that we're using. And then whatever's in the section that we're placing in can get its built-in spawns. Um, then we take a snapshot and we do mute IA0, we loop through all that. Take a snapshot, everything looks the same. If we cargo run, we'll face enemies in both sections of La Mapa. Let's take a look. If I didn't break anything, we haven't ran this since the refactor. 
So I'm nervous. It's going to be a cellular automata map, correct? Yep. And that worked. There are items here. There was an item. There, yep, there are rations. So it says you'll face enemies, but remember, every spawn is not necessarily an enemy. There was something. Yeah. So there we go. And if we go all the way over to the section, the prefab thing. Yeah, we have the traps and we have the goblins and we die and it's all good. So, we cargo run, we'll face enemies in both sections of the map. We're all happy there. So we're on the wrap up, we're done. In this chapter, we've covered quite a bit of ground. We can load Rex paint levels, complete with hand placed entities and play them. We can define ASCII pre-made maps in our game and play them, removing the requirement to use Rex paint. We can load level sectionals and apply them to the level. We can adjust the spawns from previous levels in the builder chain. And there we go. Um, so it is nice because when we place that section, we're overriding what was there before, um, but we're keeping the other stuff. So it is a, a nice way to have two different maps being smushed together without losing the integrity of either one. I like it, um, you know, because we're not. If we were just to keep all the spawns from the original map, we might have things spawning inside the walls of our new section that we plopped in, or we would just have a bunch of extra stuff that doesn't need to be there, right? So that's nice. Um, pretty good session today. Not a bad. Um, attempt there for, I mean, if we look at the little scroll bar up there, wave function, very tiny. This one, a little bit bigger. And next time we're going to do room vaults, which is a lot better, a lot, a lot bigger. And layering, builder, chaining and stuff is going to be a bit longer. So we'll, we'll be getting to that next week. So next up is going to be room vaults here on, uh, on Wednesday. What is today? The 26th. So the 28th, we're going to be doing that. And let's do the usual and just scroll down and preview what it might look like. The vault will probably be placed on your map. Here's a screenshot of a run in which I found it. So we have traps surrounding a, a health potion or something. I guess that's the vault. Um, cool. You'll encounter several vaults, unless that's what these are. I don't always want a vault. Okay. So we have different options here. Um, so we're going to have the cellular automata map, and then we're going to have a vault pop up inside of it. Oh, we're doing some layers. Interesting. And this is going to be a two-chapter marathon of prefabrication. Cool. Well, I'm excited to see this, but that's going to be next time. So thank you to anyone who showed up, whether you're lurking or chatting. I really appreciate it. If you like Rust coding, if you like roguelikes and all that, you can hit that follow button. If you like, uh, you know, watching gameplay like Dwarf Fortress, which I'll be playing tomorrow, or Caves of Cud, which I'm playing Friday, Saturday night, uh, Star Ocean the Divine Force, which I'm, I just beat the main story and I'm doing bonus dungeons now on Saturday and Sunday in the daytime, Genshin Impact, which I play Sunday night, or um, I think that's everything. Yeah, felt like there was one more missing. But uh, I also play all other kinds of games. I, I'm, I like all kinds of games. So if you're in any of that, you can hit that follow button. You can also go over to YouTube. Or if you're watching this on YouTube in the future, congrats on being in the future. I would appreciate if you do all the fun YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, notification bell. Leave a comment. I do read and I try to respond to my comments. So I'd appreciate that. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter and hit the notification bell there where I tweet every time I go live. I've had people in the past complain that Twitch notifications are not reliable for them. It's never been a big issue for me, but if that is your experience, you can follow me on Twitter and uh, hit the notification bell there to see when I go live. Because I do... Actually, I forgot today. You know what's funny? I, I, I very, very, very rarely forget. I knew I was forgetting something today. I might have still hit the button. I don't know if I hit the button or not, but I did... I did forget to update the text. If I did hit the button, then it's an old tweet. I'm going to go check. I, I actually forgot today, but we have, I have two yesterday. I have uh, two uh, the day before. 
yeah, like I've got all the other ones. So if I forget, I forget, I guess. But it's very rare that that happens. Um, that's almost all I tweet is just when I go live. Um, and then the occasional foxes and stuff. All righty. Just an odd time to realize, wait a minute, I forgot to do that today. Um, I've been saying I need to make it uh, part of my uh, multi-action when I go live that just happens automatically. But that's a, an aside that's not related to this. So good progress today. Um, I'm looking forward to the room vaults and stuff. It's another little bit of a beefy section, but we are coming up on the end of the map building stuff, which was the thing I was most excited about was seeing all the map generation algorithms. I've been very happy and, and pleased with the results there. Um, so we have layering, uh, no, we have room vaults this week, layering and builder chaining, plus fun with layers next week. And then uh, I'm just going by the chapters. If we have really short chapters, I'll do more than one. So then the week, so two weeks from now, it'll be room builders and better corridors. And then the week after that, it'll be doors and decoupling the map size from screen size. And then there's a, a section three conclusion, which will be the end of all the map stuff. Then after that, we'll be getting into making a game with a design document, raw files, data-driven design, data-driven spawn tables. I'm excited about that. Decouple it from the code a little bit because um, it's get, it's hard to maintain the code. It's easier to maintain uh, just like a, you know, a JSON file or something. Um, and then that makes it moddable too. That makes it very easy for people to add things uh, that can be read in dynamically. Um, we have making a town and populating the town, and living bystanders, game status, equipment, user interface into the woods, XP, and it can go, it goes on and on and on and on. I think there's a, a clock somewhere and I, did I pass it? Um, maybe not. I thought there was a, a day-night system at some point. Well, it doesn't matter at this point. Um, that's going to be a ways off. But here, within the next couple of weeks, we're coming up on the end of the map generation stuff, which is bittersweet. But I'm really excited to see how these techniques are applied later on down the line and building cities and everything. It's going to be a good time. So again, thank you to anyone who shows up to these live streams or watches these on YouTube. I really appreciate it. Until next time, have a good day, have a good night. Whatever it is, wherever you're at, take it easy. I'm going to go get some nachos. Turn the game console off right now.